which which have been running for the last two years. Um, now, lots of people may have been aware of the Institute for Food Research, which is what what we kind of were beforehand. Um, and actually, that that building was on the other kind of part of the park, kind of hidden behind these trees. It's actually been destroyed now. So the research park in Norwich is actually very large. If anyone hasn't been there. Um, but the IFR was a, a kind of forerunner to the Quadrant, but we're quite a different entity. So I'll just briefly explain what, what Quadrant is and what it does um, before moving on to the specifics of the science. So um, the big change in emphasis for the Quadrant Institute is that one of the huge differences compared to the old IFR is that we have patients in the building. Um, so the building um, has laboratories, as you can kind of see in this top picture, you have this, we have a big kind of open, open plan ethos, you have a big open plan labs, upstairs but downstairs we have patients in the building so you have the laboratories upstairs where people are working in um, quite translational fundamental projects largely we also have a lot of clinical research and we have um, patients downstairs so we have an endoscopy unit which is one of the largest in Europe with the capacity for 40,000 patients to be um, uh, seen yeah I almost said processed but that doesn't sound right to be seen a year um, and that means that we have access to uh, being able to run trials, access to tissue. Um, and so the idea is that the science is happening upstairs and, and the people with various gut problems are coming in the building downstairs. So that gives us a kind of unique opportunity to, to really focus in a kind of translational way in what we do. So there are, there are four kind of major research themes that run through the building. And there are lots of other things that people do as well. But these are the ones that are kind of the, the largest departments, if you like. And so one is gut microbes and health. So this is trying to understand what are the uh, hallmarks of a, of a good microbiome? How do you establish a good microbiome? And how does a microbiome um, maintain resilience throughout life? And how does it start to decay at the end of life? So there are a lot of uh, long term longitudinal studies of patients um, at either end of life in, in this uh, arm of the program. There's another uh, arm, which is food innovation in health, which is really trying to understand how the structure and nature of what we eat impacts um, our health. And a lot of that relates to um, what's happening in the uh, gut. Then we have a program, which actually was where I kind of mainly live, which is microbes in the food chain. So we're interested in how pathogenic organisms survive through the food chain, get into um, people and cause trouble. Uh, these first three programs are all supported by um, BBSRC. And we have a fourth program, which the university lead, which is looking at population health. So we have um, a very good uh, set of um, trials that have been running and lots of patients that have been enrolled for a very long time. Norfolk has quite an old population, which is where we are. Norwich, if anyone doesn't know, Norwich is in Norfolk in the east of, um, east of England, just kind of beyond Cambridge. But we have quite an old population. And one of the nice things is that they're quite... Um, they're, they're quite an immobile population. People don't move very much. So people tend to come to Norfolk and, and like it. So we have a very uh, good population for running long-term population health studies. So this kind of gives you a, a flavor for the research themes. And then just specifically for microbiome work, that one of the reasons that there's so much microbiome work happening at the Quadrum is that we were kind of half set up to do this. And we have a kind of pipeline from doing discovery work in the laboratories. We have lots of ability to do um, kind of preclinical work. So we have model colons, we have guts on a chip, uh, so we have lots of organoids, we have mouse models, including germ-free models. We also obviously have actual patient samples from endoscopy, and we have a bio, uh, bio repository on site and um, or on the research park, and we have a very close link with the bio repository. And so it's uh, very simple compared to other places to get access to patient samples. We have a very, very strong informatics team. So as sequencing has, has moved hugely, our, our ability to document the strains that are within a microbiome and not just the kind of genera or the, uh, a very high level, but a very low level has become much, much better. So there's an awful lot of um, capacity and expertise that's been built and is being built in in actually handling that data to understand what the makeup of a microbiome is and how that may change over time and what a, what a healthy microbiome may be etc um, and then we have a, a clinical research facility and I've also mentioned that we have the uh, local population that are kind of um, useful for study so that's just a kind of um, quick overview of 
of Quadrum and, and I, I guess if anyone is interested in learning more about us then then we can put people in contact with with our business development team if, if they want to know more about it or um, or they can I'll try and answer any questions. So more specifically I'm going to talk about one one piece of work that that we've uh, been developing from the Institute which is the TRADIS stuff and so just before I kind of talk about the technology the people involved in this um, uh, this is uh, lots of people involved in this but this is I've just highlighted a few of the people that have been particularly engaged in this work as one of their major bits of, of, of interest so it's myself and uh, Ian Charles who's the director of the Institute and then um, Keith Turner and Mohammed Yassir who are both expert molecular geneticists and Andrew Page who's our head of informatics at Quadrum and previously was at Sanger and Sarah, Sarah Baskowski who's a computer scientist and I think the, the point of just putting this slide together is to say that the stuff I'm going to talk about is really a combination of microbiology, molecular biology and genetics and informatics and, and if you don't have the microbiology or the informatics or the genetics then the whole thing doesn't work so um, you need uh, you need all three together to be able to, to do the stuff that um, I'm going to kind of outline and then there's some extra bits and pieces you can read if you if you want but that's the key point is to say that this is a kind of multidisciplinary technology where you need expertise from different different uh, perspectives okay so um the kind of challenges and the needs and the things we're interested in um so we we are interested in lots of things um so microbiology and bacteria impact um our lives in many many ways um so we have active interests in understanding how uh, bacteria cause disease uh, and in hospital acquired infections in biofilms how bacteria actually cause disease in hosts so whether those are uh, mammals as a proxy for humans or um, plant pathogens we're interested in understanding virulence we're interested in trying to look for uh, ways to develop better therapies if we're trying to block um, infection uh, we're interested in understanding how bugs become resistant to antibiotics so we do an awful lot of work in the amr space i'm not going to talk very much about that um, uh, we're interested in how you can use strains in vaccine development we're interested in using strains for for benefits so obviously bacteria are not all bad in fact most bacteria are good um, or at least neutral and we use them to make lots of things so we have an interest in in bioengineering and using bugs to produce things um, but today I'm just going to kind of explain the technology and then talk about how it could be applied or how we are um, beginning to apply and thinking of applying this in a microbiome context and we'll come back to that later on um, so you can see there's a there's a kind of wide range of areas where we are interested in applying the technology I'm going to describe um, and this relates to the fact that bugs are very very important um, in all of these processes so in industrial processes bacteria can be a real problem with causing contamination um, of products or they can be required to make something so you know in the production of insulin is done by a by a bacteria and um, obviously we spend a lot of time trying to kill bacteria in a clinical context and the rise of amr is one of the things that's been uh, the top of um the potential threats to humanity in, in the last few years so antibiotic resistant bacteria are a huge huge issue and we have a lot of expertise in that area so we spend an awful lot of time trying to alter the behavior of bacteria in a way that we want so either to stop them being able to grow where we don't want them to grow or to be able them to grow better in conditions where we want them to produce something that's of use to us so that's fine but we don't understand the genetic basis for how bacteria behavior is uh, the, how bacteria how bacterial behavior is controlled as well as we would like to so there has been a revolution in genome sequencing in the last 20 years and we now have literally millions of bacterial genomes um, and uh, so the, there are 200,000 salmonella genomes available for example um, but this enhanced ability to document all of that DNA and all of the genes that are present has not gone hand in hand with an advance to understand what all these genes do so we still don't know what what very very many bacterial genes do so if we want to understand how to influence a bacteria to change its behavior then we don't actually know the genes that we might need to be interacting with to do that and the gene products and trials express is 
uh, technology that will help us address this need. And uh, we're interested, as I'll kind of briefly talk about in um, various uh, spaces, which I've already mentioned. So using bugs for good, um, and we'll talk about probiotics a little bit later, um, influencing a microbiome and uh, discovering antimicrobials. So what is it? So I've talked a lot about kind of how this might be a useful thing, but I haven't actually told you what it is yet. So um, I'll just briefly outline what Tradus Express is and how it works. So Tradus stands for Transposon Directed Insert Sequencing. And essentially the principle of this technology relies on making a very, very large pool of transposon mutants. So every individual cell in this pool will get an individual transposon, which will randomly insert itself somewhere in the genome. Okay, then you have this very, very large pool. So we kind of aim to try and make about a million mutants. And what you then do in, in each one of those mutants has an insert somewhere in its genome. So some of those inserts will be of no consequence. Some of them will be of high consequence. But what you do is you then grow this pool of, uh, of mutants and you split it into a growing it in a control condition and then a test condition. So for example, if you wanted to understand the genes that are involved in growth in a, in a gut, uh, then you would grow the, the model in a gut. And then what you can do is you can take the DNA from the whole pool of cells that has been grown through your test condition. And then what you can do is you can use a sequencing approach to amplify the um, transposon insert sites that are present and you can compare the pattern of transposon mutants that are present in your control condition and your test condition. And this allows you to assay the um, whole genome for genes that are important to uh, survival in any particular stress that you're interested in. So, and I'll explain how that works again slightly more in, in another slide in a minute. So you, you grow all these mutants together. Now, one of the things that's particularly important with the Tradis Express technology is the Express bit stands for expression. So the transposon that we introduce into the genome um, doesn't just disrupt a piece of DNA wherever it lands, but it has a promoter in it that we can control its expression. And this means that we can affect the expression of adjacent genes. That means that we not only can try and destroy all the genes in the genome by inactivation and see which genes were important for survival in the stress, but we can also try and alter their expression. So, that, and I'll explain in a minute why that's, in, why that's particularly important. Um, one thing to note is that this is a generically applicable approach. Um, you can apply this to any organism, any bacteria that you can get a transposon into and, and almost all bacteria have naturally occurring transposons. So it's very versatile and you can use whatever condition you want. So essentially, a very simple way of thinking about how this technology works is to, is to compare um, the runners at the start of the London Marathon. So if you imagine that all of your transposal mutants were lined up at the start of a race, you then put them through and they all have an individual mutation somewhere in their genome. You then put them through whatever your stress is, in this case, running 26 miles, and then you see who wins. And also we're interested as well at, at who loses. So which transposons are enriched and do very, very well, and which ones do very, very, very badly. Okay, so essentially this is the kind of key idea behind this is that you have this huge pool of mutants that are competed together against each other, and that allows you to then compare in your test condition versus your control condition, mutants that have done very well, and they will have grown and replicated and become more common in the pool and mutants that have done very badly, and they would have disappeared, and you can see those differences. So. That's a kind of silly analogy, but if you actually want to look at what real data looks like, this is a little snapshot of what a, a, a mutant library looks like. So at the bottom of this slide, we have a section of a genome. This is actually an E. coli. So I'm going to talk a lot about E. coli uh, as, a, as a proof of principle, because um, basically we've just published a couple of papers around this. So um, I can refer to those quite easily without any worries about um, disclosure, etc. So here we have a section of the E. coli genome and the genes are marked by these blue boxes on the two, uh, on the different coding strands. And then above, we have a representation of where all the transposon mutants are in this pool. Now remember, every individual cell will have a single mutant um, transposon insert. But if you then aggregate the data from the whole pool, you can map it against the genome and you can see what it, where the inserts are within the pool. And that's what we're looking at here. So where you have a vertical line above the bar, 
that's where there is a transposon insertion site. And here, the sequencing can tell you how many copies of that transposon were present. So you can see, for example, here you have a, a very uh, a mutant that's uh, represented quite a lot in the library, and there you have one that's less. And blue and red refers to the orientation. So essentially, blue uh, red mutants are pointing as we look here left to right, and the blue mutants are pointing right to left. And that's important, and we'll come back to that in terms of expression in a minute. Um, but one of the things you notice if you look along the genome is you see this is a, this, we have quite a nice high density of transposon inserts within here. So every individual gene here, um, instead of having just, you know, maybe one mutation within it a lot, we'll, we'll have an awful lot. So on average, we have uh, in this library an insert about every 10 base pairs within the library. So every, you know, an average gene in E. coli is about 1,000 base pairs. So we probably have 100 different transposon inserts within, within every gene. So you have very, very high resolution coverage. But you do see that there is little blank spots in the genome. So you see little areas where there are no transposon inserts. And that's because these genes are essential. So when the library was made, DNA would have been inserted within that gene, but any of those inserts would have died. So that was a lethal event. So these are the essential genes. And that's important because the essential genes are often very, very difficult to infer much about their importance because you can't disrupt them. But conversely, those essential genes are often the ones that we are most interested in because they're very, very important to the bug. Now, one of the nice advantages with Tridus Express is that while we can't knock this gene out, we can put inserts upstream of it and downstream of it, which will overproduce or reduce expression of this gene if that's beneficial for the cell. So those mutants, if they overproduce this gene, will be selected if they have a benefit or if they make less of the gene but don't kill it, and um, they will also be selected. So we're able to, to look at expression of essential genes, and now we're able to assay those, and I'll explain that more in a second. Okay, so that's a kind of, just a quick uh, principles for a, a quick kind of um, overview of, of how it works. And now this is some data to kind of hopefully convince people that, 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 that this is a useful approach and that it does work. So, Again, this data is from E. coli, and I'm going to I'm going to use a set of data that um, is from a publication that we that we had uh, recently in genome research. So um, the stuff I'm going to talk about here is mainly all in this paper um, from February this year in genome research. There is, if anyone doesn't have a, a, a subscription to that, there was a bioarchive that had been submitted previously as well, which which you'd be able to find um, as well, and. <clears throat> What we did in this in this paper is that we used a uh, an antimicrobial called triclosan as a as a kind of test um, agent to show the the power of the technology, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this data set. So here on panel A of this figure, what we can see is we have a zoom into a little piece of the genome, and what we have here is a gene Fab I, and you can see that there are no inserts within this gene, so this is an essential gene. So you're not able to knock this gene out. And then if you look at the top row here, we have what happens uh, in the control conditions, the number of inserts, there really are not many in this, gene, in this area of the genome at all. And then when you grow uh, this library in the minimum inhibitory concentration of triclosan, so this is the concentration of the drug that we, we used for this data that will um, stop growth, you can see that you, you get a small smattering of, of inserts but then actually these bottom two lines, when we say plus IPTG, this is when the library was grown with the uh, induction of the promoter. So now we have expression coming out from our transposon inserts. You see that you suddenly get this, uh, these blue lines appear. And so these lines are transposon inserts that are, orient that are located upstream of the Fab I gene and they're pointing towards it. So what is happening here is that when you grow this library, in the presence of the uh, inducer that, that makes the promoter active, what you get is that these inserts suddenly become very, very, very beneficial when you add triclosan. And Fab I happens to be the target for triclosan, so we know that. So this was a nice piece of validation. So what's happening here is these mutants are overproducing the target, which is providing resilience against the drug. So you're saturating the drug's effect. So that's just showing you here that actually the technology really can tell you something about an essential gene without having to disrupt it. 
And then panel B just shows something separate. So there's another gene that's been uh, that's involved in survival to triclosan, and you can see these red inserts here are overproducing this gene. And there's again, there's some genes that you can't um, you can't disrupt in this area. Um, you also find lots of information about areas where there is a lot more um, mess, if you like. So here we have in, in panel C, you have uh, here this ACRAB system is an efflux pump which pumps out drugs, including including triclosan. And, and you can see this uh, large um, selection of mutants that are located here um, within the ACRR gene, which is actually a repressor of this system. So you're, you're, you're taking the break off the pump and making more of the pump. And they also, again, are oriented to produce more of the pump themselves. So you can see that we're, again, we're changing expression of this system. And then the final example in the bottom right hand corner, this is just mutation uh, inserts that are selected that are anti-sense to a gene. So RPON is a stress response gene. Again, the cell really doesn't like you knocking it out, but here we can knock it down so we can reduce its expression. Okay. So, so that data really just shows you that, that we can modify expression of genes and we can, we can um, identify genes where their expression is, is uh, changing their expression is important to a stress. Um, and again, just to kind of show that our ability to change expression is um, is important. So on the left hand panel of this figure, we have uh, the amount of expression that comes from the promoter we used in this particular experiment. And you can change different promoters for different organisms and different needs. And you can see that uh, basically you have some vector controls where you get no expression. And then when you add induction and, and in this case, we had IPTG was our inducer. You can see that a little bit of IPTG gives you a little bit of induction and then more gives you more. So you can, you can not just turn it on or off, you can, you can stratify how much expression you want. And it depends what you're aiming for, whether that's an important thing for you to do. Um, but the, the graph on the right here, this is just telling us when we run these experiments, we run the libraries with or without the presence of the inducer. And it tells us how many targets did we identify um, when we didn't have the inducer present versus when we did a whole bunch of different concentrations. And on average, we get about 20% more targets by including this ability to change gene expression. So that's important. So, so our ability to, to not just knock genes out, but to alter their gene expression means that we're getting about 20% more information on average than we would have done just by trying to disrupt the genome. <clears throat> and about 20% of the genes in E. coli are, are the essential genes. Now, that's not saying that we actually get a, get a, a readout for every essential gene. We don't, but um, it just tells us that we are getting a lot more information than we would have done in um, kind of previous approaches where you just try and disrupt genes. Okay, so just a few more kind of slides just to hopefully convince people that this approach is useful. The data is um, <coughs> uh, meaningful. And one of the questions that we're asked a lot is, okay, how reproducible is this and robust? And what we have here is just a uh, mapping of the number of reads that were present in, within each different gene that's been annotated along the genome in two independent repeats compared against each other. And actually you find that the data is very, very robust. And so this really reproduces very, very well. Um, and you have a very high correlation coefficient. So, so essentially what this is saying is if you do two independent experiments, they tend to agree very closely with each other. And I can just visualize that again in this next slide. So again, this is um, uh, just data showing transposon insert sites across. This is a, we're zoomed out a bit more now in the genome. So you get a larger view and you can see this is really quite dense. But what we have is a control condition where these, these guys were growing with no drug, but you have control one and control two, those are independent um, replicates. And then you have the same with different concentrations of drugs. Um, and you can see that really the, the concordance between the two repeats is very, very high. There are a few examples where you can see here you have a little uh, spike that's present in one control, but not the other. But, but largely, um, this data reproduces very strongly. Um, and obviously, we do repeats in our experiments. And what we're looking for is a consistent signal where in uh, one um, condition, you will see a change in the insert pattern versus the control. And you would expect that change to be in all of the replicates for, for us to take it take it forward. Um, so that's fine. But of course, the reason that we're using this technology is to say that we have all of the genome and we want to know at the end of the day, what are the genes that are important? So what are the small number of genes that we're interested in? Um, and we're making predictions. So we make predictions and we need to validate those predictions. So 
here we're just going to show again this is some more of this triclosan data and i know i keep banging on about this one experiment but it's um it's it's published it's available if people want to go and look at all the, the data and play with themselves they can um so here we had a, a prediction that uh, inactivation of this import system trka would provide protection against the drug so we think this is a, a mechanism the drug might be getting into the cell so then what we did is uh, we grew the parent strain in different conditions of the drug um, and basically the green line here on the top right is is where the, the the parent can just about deal with it doesn't really like it and then if you take the parent strain and you knock this this gene out independently so we made a separate mutation within this gene and then we would predict that it would grow better and you can see that it, it does um, and we validated a whole bunch of our targets in a similar way so so you can make predictions that you can validate now, one of the things that we do with this technology is produce an awful lot of data um, and we've made refinements to lots of the sequencing technology and the way that we do it which means that we can now run a lot of experiments in parallel quite cheaply that's great but it gives you this problem of the kind of drinking from our fire hose how do you deal with all of this data so one of the things that we've done um, and this is where the informaticians have been incredibly useful is to build a analysis tool to specifically help look at multiple data sets together um, so we produce masses of data from masses of conditions um, and we've developed a tool called albatradis which allows us to identify the genes and the networks that are shared between conditions and again this is using some of this triclosan data and um, one of the interesting things about this drug is we knew that the drug is uh, kill cells at very high concentrations but st only stops their growth at low concentrations and so if you look at the network of genes that are involved in survival at these different concentrations you can see that it uh, it really pulls apart so here we have genes in blue and they're attached to the concentration where they are identified as being important which are the colored nodes and so you can see that you really have kind of two a, a set of a network of genes involved in surviving a low concentration of the drug and in a network in the high concentration in the drug. So you can now look for uh, genes that respond uh, differently to different conditions. And the conditions can be whatever you want. So I'm, again, I'm using this drug example here, but it can be whatever. So really the, the, the whole kind of key point about this technology is you go from saying, we don't know which of the genes in the whole genome are involved, or maybe involved in multiple conditions even, to give yourself a, a, to a smaller set and then what you can also do is you can say that the genes that you have you can then try and identify which metabolic pathways are involved so we're reducing the complexity so we're going from a whole genome view to saying here uh, the key pathways that have been identified as either being um, upregulated in green or downregulated in red in response to the stress and um, so here for example this stress tells us that actually the cell wants to make amino acids and nucleosides it doesn't want to make cell structure biosynthesis so actually we're going from whole genome data to, to kind of a small number of metabolic pathways that we think are going to be very important to understand the behavior okay so that's the kind of whistle stop of of the technology and hopefully some some uh, com convincing that it actually works so how about in terms of microbiome research um so obviously in microbiome research we're very interested in using bacterial strains to to try and maintain health as probiotics and uh, to prevent infection but also as uh, potentially as biotherapeutics to treat disease so to do this we need strains to be able to do lots of things so obviously they've got to be safe they're going to have to tolerate acid and bile to, to transition they're going to have to establish a niche in the face of colonization resistance potentially um, they might need to uh, be able to survive unusual gut conditions and dysbiosis they might be kind of applying these to prevent that or to try and deal with it um, and then they have to exert some kind of beneficial effect uh, if you're going to deliver something in, in a probiotic as a as a drink or in a food then they're going to have to survive some food processing steps and we're also going to want to grow these things in bulk and inefficiently and to survive a freeze drying process potentially so um, every single one of those steps um, you can apply a trial approach to so you can understand how to improve a strain's ability to uh, survive or to perform if you like in any one of those um, niches by using trial to identify the genes that are very very good for surviving in that condition or the genes that are very very bad and that can then help you to refine your choice of strains 
Um, also, there is an awful lot of unknowns in developing strains for uh, microbiome work. So um, we're obviously very interested in, in kind of personalized or stratified um, approaches. So we might be looking for saying that we want to try and treat a subset of patients with a type of IBD. OK, so that's a kind of semi stratified approach. And the, uh, the things that we might need a bacteria to do in those patients will be different from something else. So we can actually look to say, what about in that area? What about in that need? And um, we have the ability to look at many, many different conditions in parallel. So we might want to say we want to understand the genes that are needed strain to survive lots of these different processes I've just talked about or lots of these conditions. And we might want to say that we want to compare 10 of those and find the key sets of genes that are, that are involved in all of them that might reduce variation between studies. Um, we want to know something about modes of action. So we really want to know how does a strain establish in a gut and how does it compete against other species how does it actually exert an effect and so therefore how, what impact does it have in ecological con context and i'll explain how we can how we can start to investigate that in a minute so a kind of a, 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 an imaginary if you like um application would be to try and refine a, a probiotic so say we wanted to develop a, a probiotic a better probiotic for a type of ibd so if we started with a, a start point where we say we have an idea about a strain that looks like it has an association with a beneficial outcome. Okay, so we're now beginning to get more and more information about what, what a good microbiome looks like. Then the first thing we need to do is identify and isolate that strain. And we're able to do that now much better than we used to be. So we've been able to identify and isolate various com uh, commensal strains from, uh, from patient microbiomes um, associated with health benefits. Uh, and then you'd want to make a mutant library in that strain. In that in that strain, so uh, we've made libraries in many many different species: gram positive, gram negative, pathogens, commensals, um, anaerobes, aerobes. Um, it's generically a, a, an approach that's applicable, with um, some some kind of tweaks for for specifics. But it's a, a generally applicable approach to make a mutant library. So you'd make your big mutant library. You would then grow that library in the system that you're interested in, the condition that might be a, a model of the disease. If you have one, it might be a mouse, it might be an organoid, or you might be interested in some of those earlier stage. How do you survive um, going through bile or whatever? Find the genes that are involved. You would then get some hypotheses. You can validate those by making mutants and putting them back in your model. Um, that will then tell you the strain characteristics that you're looking for. And you can then say, well, okay, we can now sequence tens of thousands of isolates um, and we can look in those strain collections and we can find isolates that match the profile that Tradus has told us should be beneficial. So that means you don't have to do any genetic engineering. Um, so you can actually take a, take a natural isolate that we predict will have a better performance. And then you can verify that that strain does what you want and eventually you can start putting it into people. So that's a kind of idea for, or, or an overview for, for how this technology can help in this development process. Um, but one of the things that we're also very interested in is, is understanding the basis of interaction between strains in, in, in the gut or in other contexts. So if you uh, imagine that you made a Tradis library in, in strain A or species A, and then you made one in species B, then you can make these libraries in such a way that you can identify which transposon came from which, uh, which species and you can compete them. So in this context, you've got a a very kind of simplified cartoon of a, of a library here we've got four different inserts you would actually have a million um, and then you grow these two strains together and you find that uh, this insert here has proliferated uh, and so this uh, insert is very very beneficial so you would know that the gene that's being affected there um, gives you a, a, a basis for understanding competition of this strain versus the other one and the same for, same for this one so, so we can compete libraries against each other, and this begins to, to help to really rapidly understand the mechanistic basis for, for competition and, and interaction, actually not even just necessarily competition, so some of the beneficial interactions that we might be interested in between gut microbiome species. So um, Trodis can give you a kind of huge um, head start in, in understanding these, comp these competitions between species. So that's again something that we're working up, that we've been working on. Um, so there, uh, that gives a kind of idea for, for our, our interest in, in microbiome research, but um, Tradis is also applicable to, as I've kind of said, anything where, where microbiology is, 
an interest or a problem. So we're interested and we're working on biofilms, um, bioprocessing, the microbiomes of companion animals, food producing animals. Um, I've talked a lot about the gut, but we have an interest in, in other microbiomes beyond the gut. So we have a very nice collaboration with Elena Gavrilovich at the University of East Anglia about the skin. Um, which is in vaccine production, food pre preservations, um, novel antimicrobials, basis of production by bacteria of outer membrane vesicles for delivery of all sorts of things. Um, this technology is not necessarily restricted to bacteria, so we're interested in, in getting this into yeast and other higher organisms. Um, and just kind of finally, the last couple of, of slides, um, uh, just a quick comment about how this relates to some other approaches. So. Um, Kind of traditionally you might have been making individual gene knockouts which we still do for validation but it's relatively laborious and, and only gives you resolution a whole gene uh, transcriptomics can be very useful again tends to tell you whether a gene is involved whereas TRADIS can actually tell you because of the very very high density we often find it's like i should have said earlier we often find it's not just a gene is important but a part of the gene so inserts within a domain are important or not um, so we have very, very low, almost base pair resolution, and, and the cost is now relatively cheap. Um, GWAS, again, gives you very good resolution, but there's a signal-to-noise problem. So, so we, we think that we can pair well against some of the other kind of approaches for doing this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of conscious I've been going on for a while, so I think I'll probably finish at that point. And just the take-home messages are that, that Tradus Express allows whole genome to be assayed um, in a single experiment for importance in a, in a phenotype. And um, we can now do this at scale and lots of conditions at once. And we're interested in applying this um, in lots of projects and particularly uh, moving into a biotech and microbiome space. Uh, there is a video that explains the technology that's been produced. And um, the Albertrader software is also available there. And I know this is being recorded, so people can look back at these. And just finally, some thanks to all of the people that have been collaborating in, in our work in this, this area. And um, we're funded by the BBSRC. So again, um, thanks to them for, for basically underpinning um, a lot of this. And there's a link to a little thing on our web page to some more stuff. So, so that is, I think, the only thing I wanted to say. Hopefully that's been of some interest. And in, um, I guess if there are any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Right. Thank you so much, Mark. That was, that was a brilliant presentation. It was great to hear more about uh, Quadrum and Tradis Express. So um, we're moving into question time. And so what we'll do is, is take questions both from the chat as well as give a few people a chance to ask questions over audio. So um, shortly, I'll, I'll choose an initial question out of the chat. During that time, if you would like to ask a question um, using your microphone. If you could, um, in the participants tab, click the green check yes, and I can scroll down and, and find people who have done that and unmute them or, or a thumbs up or something like that would be fine. Um, and if, if I'm incorrect in unmuting you, uh, just let us know or remute yourself, that's fine. So, so while I give you a chance to do that, here's a, an initial um, question for you and that is, what is the efficiency of transposition in high GC organisms? So the example given is Streptomyces, which has a 72% GC ratio. Yeah, okay, so uh, it depends on your transposon is the, is the answer. So most organisms have transposons that are efficient, but you would not necessarily use the same transposon for everything. Um, so we have made libraries um, in organisms from Campylobacter to Pseudomonas, which have kind of uh, fairly good bookends of GC content and you, 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 you kind of cut your cloth accordingly in terms of the um, transposon that you will use. But yeah, Streptomyces is, is obviously, Streptomyces genetics is uh, notoriously difficult, but, um, but, but yeah, you, you basically just, uh, you, you modify the transposon that you're using to one that is efficient for the organism. Great, um, thank you. So, so another question, I'm not sure if, if either nobody wants to ask or maybe the green uh, checks aren't working so you could use a, a different uh, shape, but otherwise here's, here's another one that we've had through the chat. And so this is kind of along a, a similar vein is have you tried using this technique on anaerobes with low transformation efficiency? Uh, we've made libraries in some anaerobes, yeah. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the, things that you need to do first is is to obviously you need to make your library and the efficiency of transformation is uh is something that will vary a little bit strain to strain species to species 
there are different ways you can do it from electroporation to actually conjugative delivery is is better um, so sometimes it's worth investing the time to build a conjugated delivery system to get a, a plasmid based method to get your DNA into the strain. Um, obviously, some species are naturally competent, so it does vary species to species. Um, but yes, we have been able to make libraries in anaerobes. Yeah. Great. Um, OK, so we, we have uh, the first person who, who wants to uh, try to use their microphone. So if you could go ahead and I'll, I'll unmute you now. Is it Geert? I'm terrible with Dutch name, sorry. Um, but I'll unmute you now. If you could just introduce yourself and then uh, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, it's Gertie in case oh, hi, Gertie. Uh, for, for non-Dutch uh, people. So, uh, thanks, Mark. Excellent talk. I enjoyed that very much. And Thank you. I also asked the streptomyces question already. Okay. Uh, as a follow-on from that, because we know in streptomyces, electroporation is not always uh, very efficient. Yeah. Uh, have you explored uh, other means of uh, delivery of the transposome into other organisms, whether streptomyces or any other? Yeah, so, so we haven't done it with streptomyces. Yeah, okay. We haven't done it with streptomyces, but I know... Um, um, I, I know that there have been some really nice recent advances with um, actually delivery of CRISPR into streptomyces into, and, and so actually I think that's looking really promising. We haven't actually made a streptomyces library but um, in theory there's, you, there's no reason why, why you shouldn't. Um, as I kind of just briefly mentioned, one of the nice ways to do it at high efficiency is if you have a, if you have a um, plasmid delivery system that really works very nicely. Because if you if you can engineer it that you can just deliver your plasmid and the plasmid is a suicide plasmid, um, and the transposition will happen in vivo, then you really only need to get it into the organism once. If you can then have a um, uh, a controllable suicide um, plasmid, that um, again obviously that doesn't happen so easily for many many species. But um, electroporation is fine. Um, conjugation is is the easiest way if it's if it's possible. Excellent, because conjugation is possible for many of the streptomyces. Yes. Well, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah but very I mean, the, the, the problem with conjugation is that you obviously need the, you need to have a way of counter selecting for the plasmid once it's in, in that you, if you just deliver a load of plasmids then, that you can't then select against, then you just basically deliver a load of plasmids and you don't know that your transposons are in the genome where you want them to be. But, but yeah, conjugation is, is a good way. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, I will uh, put you on uh, mute. There we go. Um, so um, I'll take another question uh, from the chat. Uh, so Laura has asked you um, if you've tested this on any organoids, organoids, sorry, or notobiotic animals yet, and if not, how easy do you think it'd be to adapt these techniques to these types of environments? Um, so would the added complexity make the bioinformatics significantly more difficult or, or would this be possible? Uh, yeah, okay, it's definitely possible. Um, I can't say too much um, about the specifics, but yes, it's definitely possible to put libraries through animals and pull them out the other end and make sense of it. Um, has been done. Um, I, I, yeah, I can't give any detail about it because actually it's an experiment that we've that's it's it's a it's a quadrum experiment, but it's a collaborator's experiment and they haven't um, yeah, they've done, they've done, but yes, it works, yes. <laughs> Great, um, so so we have one request, if you could go back one slide, um, I think a few people wanna see the Vimeo link, uh, so we could just leave that up while we take a, okay. a couple more questions. And, and just sure. to say, um, Mark's portion of the talk is is recorded, and so we'll make sure to get these out as well. And, and I can also ask him for some of the links to go out separately from the video, so they're easier for you to access in the follow-up email. Um, so, uh, Conscious of the time, I think we'll just take one more question from the chat and, and we'll probably leave it there. Um, but of course, you can get in touch with myself and, and probably find Mark's details on Quadrum's website as well if you have other questions. But so, so as a final question, um, could you comment on validation? So what proportion of knockouts uh, mm. do, you show, do you need to show for the expected phenotype based on the TRADIS data? Yeah, okay, so that's a, that's a good question. So. Um, Validation is something that, so actually the, 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 I'll give a short answer. The, a long answer to that is that the genome research paper that I um, mentioned that we just had published has, has got quite a lot of uh, validation in it. So we, in that paper, what we did is we took a bunch of targets and we, um, that the TRADIS had predicted and then we, we, we got about, oh, about 50 um, inactivation mutants 
um, or actually, sorry, more than that. Um, and each one of those was made in two different ways. And then we measured their growth and saw how many of those uh, followed the prediction from the from the child experiment. Uh, the the short answer to that is that largely predictions make sense and they follow, and you can see a phenotype as you would you would expect. So it works pretty well but not always and sometimes we find that the TRADIS is actually very it's it's because it is a competitive fitness experiment between all these mutants growing against each other sometimes if you then just take an individual strain and a knockout you find that actually the way you've made that knockout may not be as subtle as the TRADIS mutant that was selected so it might actually be within a particular domain of a gene or it might be in a particular part of a gene um, or the effect might actually be quite small and an individual mutant won't have maybe an MIC jump or change, but if you do a, a competitive growth com uh, assay, you see it. So basically the short answer is the validation works most of the time, not all of the time. And sometimes the TRADIS is, you, when you actually really dig into it, you find that the TRADIS is right, but the effect is actually very subtle. So it's a very, very sensitive to tell you genes that, it, it will identify genes that have a huge phenotypic impact, but it will also identify genes that have quite a small phenotypic impact. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I mean, there's some, there are some great questions uh, still in the chat. So as I say, um, feel free to email me. I can pass them on to Mark. Maybe he can, he can take those separately. Things yeah, like sure looking at to. rates of transposition into genetic islands and prophages, et cetera. So, so great questions. Yeah. Okay. We um, get those. <laughs> so, so I will, uh, I will leave it there. So, so just to say, um, I, everybody from home, even though we won't be able to hear it, if you could all thank uh, Mark Weber again for the <laughs> brilliant presentation. Um, I'm sure there's lots of silent applause coming, uh, coming through for you. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's great to have you. As I say, we're gonna send up a follow-up email if you had any issues, um, we've recorded this. Get in touch if you have suggestions, if there's ideas for other webinars or want to give a talk as well, let us know. Um, and in general, uh, thank you again for joining and, and make sure to stay safe and take care. So thank you again. I'll, I'll end the webinar now. Uh, best wishes. <laughs>